Um, thank you so much. Um, really a uh, pleasure to be here. This is a uh, kind of a hybrid talk, I guess, because we're being looked at for a very particular piece of work. And so I tried to put together uh, ideas and images that connected those ideas having to do with our work that were, um, I felt, somehow pertinent to the particular nature of um, the uh, um, Nature and Science Museum. Let me start with just some really general, they might seem redundant or kind of obvious, but I want to say them anyway. Um, in terms of what do we do as architects? Because it starts with me in, in very kind of basic, very kind of first principle kind of ideas. Um, we ask questions and we're um, persistent and um, kind of dogged and sometimes somewhat annoying as we uh, ask and ask more questions. And um, those questions um, are trying to um, find a location for architecture and location within cultural terms, within pragmatic terms, within urbanistic terms, etc. And I've done that through um, investigate, investigation, through teaching for, for 35 years, and I've done it through my practice. Um, I was a founder at SciArc, one of the founders of SciArc, and uh, my practice were coterminous in 1972. And um, well, I was 27 years old, and uh, it was in, I couldn't separate the two at that time. It, it, it was ir irrelevant. We were just um, questioning things and trying to figure out what architecture um, meant and how it was changing. Well, part of that is uh, I, I tell my students when they ask for advice is um, stay alert. And uh, I try to remind myself. Because I think one of the things we do today is um, we're, um, we try to keep pace with the world. And the world is changing um, kind of beyond our imagination. It's unknowable. And it's, um, it wasn't that long ago that people talked about the future. The future as an intellectual idea, the, as, a, as a conceptual idea. It's long gone. And today, we're just trying to get our arms around the present. And you only have to read the newspaper. And all of us could probably agree, to some extent, that that's really what we do. And architects, um, as architects, as urban planners, um, we, um, we interpret somehow. So we're working collectively, um, client, um, multiple client, including city, um, the direct client, um, a contractor, and on and on, huge groups of uh, subcontractors, engineers, and specialists of all type. And um, a bit like a film director, especially the definition of maybe an auteur, um, we're somehow directing, focusing this effort and trying to bring together huge numbers of, uh, of, of elements and pieces that all are, um, what, they would go their own direction if they just responded to uh, the vicissitudes of everyday life, to contingency. And we're trying to focus that, right? Well. Uh, it's still pretty general. That's what any writer would do, any poet would do, any painter would do, any sculptor would do, right? That's when you're looking at something, it's somehow coherent. And really, um, I was thinking when I was very, very young, and I had no understanding what architecture was, not that I have a clear idea what it is today, uh, the, somehow what you recognize is a, um, is a direction which represents something that's clear and coherent. And usually it gets attached to the author, and I don't particularly agree with that, meaning it has a voice. And you, you connect that voice to an ego, to a person. And I think it's actually a little more complicated than that, because in my generation, I think we were challenging the, the, the location of the, the word morphosis, the name morphosis, not my name, a collective idea, that um, already, as a young man, I had seen architecture um, that was something much more collective, and it was connected to a a thinking process that came out of a group of people. And um, I ended up being the thought leader. As I get older, I realize I'm much more a thought leader than an architect in the design sense. Somebody you think about drawing, and it comes out of your brain. And I remind my students all the time, because there's a, a notion that people are born with creativity. They're born with a self. And I don't believe that. There is no self. You earn the self. All of us do that. Um, architecture operates like language. It's appropriated and it's mimetic, absolutely like verbal language. And if you have no connection to verbal language, you'd never talk, right? And the first words are quite similar among all cultures, and they're ga ga and goo goo and da da, and you know the, the term. And as you, as you progress, you're literally appropriating, and it goes from word sounds 
to, to um, what? Non-word sounds, to words, to sentences, to paragraphs, to narratives, etc., to meta-narratives, right? And architecture is the same. We all steal something. Because again, I tease my students, because everybody's supposed to not steal things, like it's something wrong with like, oh no, 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 steal everything. Everything you see, absorb it, take it. And if you want to develop yourself, meaning if you want to continue that continuity and move architecture some way, you'll earn it, like all of us, no matter what we do. If you actually want that, everybody doesn't want that, or everybody doesn't want to do the work for it, and that's another discussion. But I'm extremely interested in um, that collaborative process. And I'm a person, and we're a studio that requires pushback. I personally require um, an engagement and some sort of a discourse. And if you gave me an empty field in the middle of nowhere, that would not be my project. That, I'd, that'd be the one that'd be the most difficult for me. I need the engagement with something to, um, to relate to and to talk about. It's very much kind of how we work. Um, Tonight, I'm going to discuss a series of issues, like I said, having to do with, um, I'm not going to explain the projects in total. I'm going to use little bits and clips of things to, use, to make certain points. And um, I'm going to talk about issues that, um, again, they pertain specifically to the, to the Museum of Nature and Science. And they're going, to, they're going to talk about participation and the kind of the human character in architecture. And they're going to talk about an architecture which is didactic. I've been fascinated for my whole career. And, and the notion that architecture itself teaches, and you read it, and you, you don't read it like you read normative, again, um, language. You read it within a more abstract way, but it, it, it communicates something, and it does, um, it forms a, a pedagogical or an educational function. And in the case of this piece of work, it becomes really kind of crucial. Um, it's interactive, and it demands inquisitiveness, because I'm absolutely fascinated by work that um, makes you scratch your head. Um, and again, we're going to probably have really different opinions about this. I don't really even care whether people like or don't like our work. It's kind of, of course, I'm like a normal person. I prefer people like it than I like it. But uh, what I'm really interested in is it's not neutral. That would kill me. That would be total failure if it was, if it was not responded to, meaning that it's um, somehow neutralized, that it doesn't somehow do something to you. It doesn't act on you. And that for me, that is the most important thing. And then I would like to make the case, or I, I would make the case, that today we're a little bit over-concerned with how things look. Because um, I don't think it's the, really the, the major kind of territory, what architecture can do. Um, first of all, um, the way something looks is a, um, it's physiognomic, the character of the thing, is uh, culturally laden. You see something based on your culture, and it's a complicated equation. Your culture in terms of where you, um, how you were educated, where you come from, the ethnicity or the territory, the area you're from, the way you see the world. And so when you're looking at something today, in, um, especially let's say in this country, and I'll include Dallas absolutely as part of a large city which represents a polyglot to some extent, and it's, heterogen it's heterogeneous, and it's becoming more so, like Los Angeles, I'm gonna talk about that later. And um, so the discussion is, well, beauty to whom? To somebody from um, Turkey, or um, Bangladesh, or Indonesia, or upstate New York, or Atlanta? I can't even use LA, because there's 134 different cultures there, so I, we, we'd, we'd go nowhere. And so, that, again, it's kind of led me to actually, we have to kind of relocate our work and kind of think about it in other terms, in terms of how it kind of performs and how it operates for different types of programs. And again, it seemed to be incredibly relevant for a science museum, because in some way, um, it has its own subject that's bigger than us, that's larger than us. Today, as we're going through the, the existing facility, and you're looking at paleontology and you're looking at the millions of years and it was a scale and I was trying to figure it out and then I realized it was actually between 340 million and 180 million and you, you, you had to kind of quickly stop and get your head around it and it was actually, the bar said I think 210 million and you go, woo, I have to kind of, kind of re, kind of calibrate what I'm talking about. It was this thing I'm looking at, Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus Rex, what was it, I don't know, one of, the, one of those sources, right? And, was, and then you're going, woo, that's, um, we're now in, geological time, and we have to kind of completely get around it. Well, they're fascinating projects, because this is a, a, a problem that um, where architects should participate with this notion of kind of how we see something 
and, and how we see architecture. And it's can be seen from many, many different viewpoints, not counting demographics and age and a small kid and, and, and a, a middle-aged kid and an adult and on and on. Um, and then there's going to be issues that pertain to urbanism, um, complicated site at a simple site simultaneously, kind of a typical site in some ways that it has no front, it has four different edges that are all fronts or again, it'd be part of the problem. And um, it's going to talk, I'm going to talk about sustainability, which um, makes an absolute obvious fit for the nature of nature, because if, if anything has changed in the last, in the 20th century, is the whole definition of nature. It's no longer um, this given thing. It's highly influenced and manipulated by mankind, and there's no longer, it's impossible to separate the human character and nature. They're now seen as completely singular. And um, again, 19th century, we had a very romantic, broad idea of the purity of nature, right? The broad kind of notion of nature in a very, very different construct than we do today. And again, it seems to be just incredibly interesting. And then you get to sustainability, the way we use resources. Uh, and again, I would say Dallas in that sense is quite parallel to Los Angeles and it's a um, kind of volatile problem. And then of course, when looking at a museum, you would expect it to be somehow didactic and um, exemplary of dealing with state of the art, the way we deal with nature, since it's a, right? Since that's part of the topics. And then um, finally, some discussion about symbol icon, which is um, kind of a topic that I guess everybody is familiar with, because architecture is so much now about its iconographic value, and you recognize these things, and it seems like architects have been asked to produce icons, and in some ways the icon is just about as important as the building, because how it's advertised is how it's seen, and again, you probably know that discussion. Okay, um, <laughs> I've been told that uh, an hour, I'm going to be yanked, so I'm going to have to get, get moving here. Um, and I like to kind of go at my own pace until I look at the eyes out there that are starting to conk on me. But I, so I got to get moving. Okay, um, I'm going to start this kind of trajectory. And um, oh, I want to remind you that um, this is the inside of the Hoopa Bank in Austria. And uh, they're, they're performing a piece of Shakespeare. And um, that the buildings are both foreground and background. And uh, I think today it's a really important discussion. The buildings keep going back and forth. They're part of a stage set for something else. And that's where I give away to, my, the, to the project. And they're, quote, mine. Their architecture, or they're about something that, that we develop as an idea. Um, and more and more, um, buildings are used as part of a broader environment in terms of the way they're connected to the city through media, et cetera. OK, um, education. We've done a series of schools, and I think all of them have very particular points that might be interesting to you. Um, we produced this school, it's a Diamond Ranch school in, in the eastern part of Los Angeles, and we decided to kind of take the whole idea of a school apart. And when I was interested in this notion of um, inquisitiveness, because I would have said, um, again, I'm stealing it out of your brain, because I assume most of you would see the same thing, uh, that inquisitiveness is the basis of education. To our role is to make young people question things, right? And, and to somehow embed that within them. So when they, you leave them, the teacher, and they move out in the world, they are just naturally curious and they ask questions. And those questions are absolutely vital for our culture. This is a culture of, um, it's a service industry. We went from agriculture to um, industry to service. And so what is a service industry? Well, I'm part of it. Anybody in law is part of it. Well, just about probably all of you are part of it. Um, it is intellectual and creative capital, right? And either, uh, and that requires um, an agile, open, continually investigating brain to stay in pace. Otherwise, we don't have a culture economically, right? And I'm fascinated with that. So we went to work and uh, kind of produced a school that looked different and um, tried to. Um, produced something that absolutely forced young people to kind of rethink what a school was. And it was kind of part of a landscape. And it, it joined with the land in a certain way. And it came through a series of firm, for, form, forms that had an absolute rigor, a mathematical rigor that I can go back and explain to you very particularly. They weren't um, drawn in a pictorial sense. And um, well, some interesting things happened that had nothing to do with side effects. All of a sudden, filmmakers and advertisers started using this. And this is part of a film I can't remember the film. What is it? The Cell. The Cell. Have you heard of The Cell? Yeah. I don't know what it is. Anyway, it's The Cell. <laughs> what was interesting about this is what happened to the kids. I myself, eh, uh, okay. Um, two things happen. One, one, it develops a serious dinero for the school. 
In fact, right now we're approaching $500,000. Am I exaggerating? Am I right? This is mine. <laughs> Anne-Marie Burke here is mine. My partner and she keeps me straight. Um, we're approaching $500,000 um, and it goes, back to the, it goes back to the student fund, which I'm really proud of, and it, it, a little more, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get close to my fee, and I can say I did this thing pro bono. But what, what's more, more important, I'm not, that did nothing to do with this job, so don't take that as any, uh, <laughs> And now writing in rights in our contract, I realize I'm missing something. The, um, what was really interesting, it was a connected tissue to the students. And I think walking through the museum today, I was very kind of taken by what's taking place, especially in maybe nature more than science, is that, um, in fact, we were discussing how experience, especially going through the, um, the natural, the, the, the taxidermy part, it was like more like reminding you of museums like this all over the world that you've seen before, and it's like a type of museum, and it's, just, it's kind of really dead. Well, it is dead, they're stuffed, right? <laughs> and, 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 and then what a young kid sees, and we're going back and forth, Scott, and again, one of my associates has young kids, and we were talking about his kid's response. But one of the things is we have to translate this into something that's um, accessible to young people, which are usually stimulated by modern medium, right? They're used to enormous horsepower. It started with film, right? And so you've got to understand you're reaching a person with, with, with um, what, a, a baseline of that kind of energy level that's being focused on them. And of course, you look at advertising, and et cetera, et cetera, and this goes right off the top. Well, with that, um, we're, we're connected to any number of kind of projects now that are looking for fundraising. You know, you could say the same with an opera, anything with connected classical music, right? Everybody's looking for future um, donors, but they're looking for patrons, they've got to get with it. You've, you've got to evolve. Each of those forms has to evolve because what you're looking for is the next audience, the next layers of audience, right? And you're, you're exactly in that position, you meaning the, the museum. And anyway, what was so interesting about this that I didn't understand for a year or so is that the students, um, somehow this validated its um, contemporariness. So again, it doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it, it was just kind of like, it was kind of like today and the fact that film wanted it and advertising wanted it, it ended up being incredibly valuable. Another very, very different kind of project. This is a uh, science school across from USC. And um, there's a kind of really funny, kind of very um, uh, old fashioned, kind of Eastern, really um, kind of Arcadian park that sets um, a natural history museum over here and a science museum and um, what was an armory. And we um, were asked to take the armory and convert it into a part of a school. We added a kind of piece along the along Exposition Boulevard. And, um, and then there was a third element, which was a, um, a facility, it's called Amgen, that teaches teachers, and it was the first school in the United States which hooked up a science museum at a school. So the science, me science museum became a resource for the elementary school, and then they, they developed a wing that taught teachers science. Because there's a huge problem today of, um, of the numbers of people we have available to teach science, and the number of people that are graduating. I'm, I'm connected to USA and I'm connected to Columbia and Harvard. And um, it's amazing, if you look what's going on in college, um, over half the, the seats are being filled by non-Americans because there's no one available in the science. It's really, and they have to, people want jobs. It's really nutty, right? And the, um, Jeff Rudolph, the director of the museum who made the deal with the school, is interested in getting involved in that equation. And the system, again, this is a tiny little plan. You're, I'm gonna show you something where we took the whole middle of the space and turned it into a, uh, a garden, and here it comes as it comes out of the site. The idea was, um, you don't see the building from this direction, and the berms, we're trying to get rid of the fence. No chain link, it's in a rough area. It's called manual arts. Um, people get killed here, guns go off. And we built a berm and, and found a way to make this very private, but not look like a penitentiary, right? We were absolutely, um, we were committed to make this into a very, very optimistic place. And so here it is as it comes out of the street and becomes an icon and part of a gateway into the USC campus. And right across the back here is the Coliseum. And it becomes a, um, it goes from a very passive, kind of non-existing thing from the park to a very kind of aggressive, strong thing, which is part of the gateway. And then this is the armory that we redid. And it was a really, it'd be a long, complicated problem, but it was a huge space and we had nothing, we had no use for it. And, or they didn't have any use for it. So we, we filled it, half of it with a half acre landscape and then below that are cafeterias and service spaces and it's this is Hami Bamboo and 
I'm going to photograph it in another two months, but it's going to come way up here finally. It's a forest. And then you'll see in a minute, in this forest, there are various um, experiments, and it's all connected to biology and zoology. And there's a fish pond, and there's, stu there's student places to study. And we put little places for 15 students. And the notion was, in this part of the town, none of the kids um, get to the mountains, and none of the kids travel, even if you can go for an hour and a half in LA. And so we brought the, the mountain down to the kids, the forest down to the kids. And it's also um, this very quiet, passive place. You can kind of imagine if you're going into this, especially as it, as it continues. And it's, 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 it's not mixed plants, it's just a bamboo forest. We're literally taking them to Tokyo or to Bali or wherever you want to name. And um, it's been really, really interesting. And then these interstitial spaces all about people. And then again, another school, I'm just going to talk about one thing, which is very, very literal. As you come in, we have this long wall. This is the International School in Long Beach. And it's, um, it's called the International School because Long Beach is one of the most diverse ethnic cities and, and, a, and, a, and a city that's usually diverse already. It has something like um, 55 different ethnicities in one school. And um, we discussed how architecture can much more directly deal with the problem. We put this mural that actually goes way like that. And um, we put together um, 100 authors from, um, and we put a matrix from northern to southern hemisphere and from, um, I think we started with Sophocles even. From, from the Greeks forward to the present. You're looking at Maya Angelou Leo right there. And the notion was, and they have, you can't see Tchaikovsky is right behind here, and he's got this great face, this big beard. It's just captivating the kids. And the idea was, it, in, in many households, it would be possible that at six, seven, eight, nine years old, you would at least hear the name. Obviously, you're not you're reading it, but you're somehow familiar with it. And the notion was to make kids familiar with these people that they would have to be familiar with if they're proceeding with higher education. And they just live with it. And it does, they're all not all going to get it. Eight will get it. I have no clue, right? And it's became very interesting. We're pursuing that now in another, another project. OK, we've been another really, really different subject. Um, I started doing very small projects, which are objects, which were sculptures, which were part of buildings. And I was, um, this is way back, and it's kind of stayed with me. And um, this is um, uh, Diderot. Um, and in, in the middle of the 19th century, he put out a, a encyclopedia of objects. And he, he, he tried to draw um, every object made to mankind. And it's an amazing little set of, set of books. And um, this is a, a weaving machine, obviously. And I got fascinated in this idea of the intelligence of objects. You make objects, and they hold intelligence. right? And uh, it led us to a whole series of projects. So when we were doing the... Uh, Cedar sinai um, Oncology Unit, um, which was um, uh, its major, kind of the piece of it was for uh, pediatric oncology. Um, we put this sculpture in it and this fishbowl, and um, you'll see in a minute, um, in a tree where the site used to be. Most oncology is underground because of radiation therapy, et cetera, so that you're always going underground, and we wanted to deal with the undergroundness, not the best metaphor um, for the treatment. And um, we left this sculpture in, in, as a datum of the ground. We put a tree. We put a tree in it, sign, sign, signifying just the obvious life and growth and, and, and etc. And then um, this piece had a screen, and you can't see it. it has, it's a, a seating area, and we built a space for a storyteller. And um, they drew themselves and photographed themselves on the screen, and then put mustaches on them. And it was really fascinating because we were directly with the, the, the psychologist and with Bernard Salik, who was the, the CEO of this group. And uh, in the beginning, they thought it'd be horrible, and because um, it's really moving. I mean, these are these are little kids, and they have the same reaction. Their hair goes, and, but it's really amazing to watch them interact, and that they're just completely normal. And they were saying, no, 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 they would never draw themselves. They don't want to look at themselves. Completely not true. They were just totally normal. And this became um, kind of a, a center that was not only the symbol of the place, which he used to kind of symbolize his own institution, but it became the uh, kind of the social center of the place, and it became just fascinating to me. And then the thing itself was this tinker toy. We talked about it. It's, it's a stair. Again, it's a, a, a mythological stair into the, to the sky, and it, we, we tried to load it with various types of mythology. And then through various projects, we built kind of quasi-machinery or apparatuses. This one directly connected to the image I showed you, which is talking about the weaving process and we got just fascinated with this. Well, um, currently, a project that's under construction right now, this is the Caltech um, Astrophysics Lab um, at Caltech. 
And um, you're going to see these kind of hood pieces that are kind of moving out to the sky here. And uh, kind of this kind of very simple, kind of quiet building that's on this uh, kind of quasi-Spanish campus in Pasadena, conservative town. It became really clear that uh, the building was going to have to be quite restrained. And um, here it is here. Well, again, now we're taking this idea of apparatus. And again, I'm showing this because this is, this is really a science project at a fairly high level. And uh, we're using this as the entry. So you're going to enter the space, and you're entering it here. And as you enter, you look out at one of these, a telescope <laughs> in the sky. And as you come through, you look out of another one in this direction, and you're kind of coming down. And there's going to be this, literally, we built them a kind of an interpretation of the instrument that they use, the primary instrument. Well, they don't even use this instrument, really. They use the Hubble. But the instrument they still use, what's the one on um, Keck? That's it. They, of course, they still use it. Um, but we used this as kind of the symbol of the building and worked with um, a whole group of astronomers. And this is kind of a, a drawing of that piece and you're going to be moving, and you're always aware of the directionality of their project, which is space. And um, again, I haven't got time. I could tell you stories forever. It was really hilarious working with uh, uh, astrophysicists. Or they make artists look like the most normal people in the world. <laughs> I mean, I, I could tell you stories for hours about the meetings. People would come in and out. They never say hello to you. They just walk out, and you go, is uh, so-and-so coming back? Oh, no, he's just gone. Or the, you, 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 you go over to ask them a question, and they're like somewhere in their brain. You have no idea. They're in Tahiti or somewhere. And uh, they're really interesting. And then at one point, I was asking them how we should make these trajectories. And they just looked at me disgustedly going, oh, my god, you, you know nothing about astrophysics. And if you know anything about astrophysics, the, 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 the planets, hmm, all of the celestial bodies around the Earth are more or less uniform. So there's no place to point. And modern physics will tell you there's billions and billions of objects, and they're, they're everywhere, and they're uniform. And I went, oh, thank you. And I'll go back and do a one-on-one next time <laughs> before I talk to you again. And then we've done installations. And again, I'm, I'm kind of in this other kind of course now, because um, working, we come from both directions, micro and kind of program, meaning the installations, and macro, which I'm going to get to. And um, it's been part of our work as an architect having to do with our own installations when we're asked to do shows, et cetera, and develop the shows. And today, a lot of museums, uh, especially for architects, want you to develop a work and not just show work. They want you to make something that talks about who you are. And we did this piece for the Netherlands Architectural Institute in Rotterdam. And, and um, a woman named Christine Ferreis runs it. And it's absolutely the most supreme place in the world right now for architecture. And they're very, very aggressive. We built this piece that's going to move. I think I have it. Um, we're looking down now. The top was this kind of abstract piece, and, and the environment's going to move. It's going to open and close. It's going to become kind of open to a view, close to a view, and it's going to talk about all kinds of notions of motion. It moves an hour, every hour. And I was um, playing games with the fast food folks because architecture works more on biological time than it does on uh, media time. And so it moved imperceptibly over an hour. So you could just come in and leave and never even get it if you're the fast food guy. And, um, but if you stayed, you realized it was moving at a pace that's somehow commensurate, right? Because you don't perceive the sun moving around, and blah, 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 right? And, and, then looking, and then that was platonic. And then looking down, we had the show. Beneath us, like archaeology, we had the pieces of work. And you're going to see now, as it's opening, it also opens up the thing below it. Can you say that? The pieces move? Chink, chink, chink. Chang. Yeah? OK. <clears throat> that one led directly to something else, which was one of the most interesting kind of installations we've done. Um, Frederick Amon of the Shallower Dance Company um, saw the show and immediately connected it to uh, movement of the human body and um, asked, asked us to do a piece for him. And we opened up the uh, Art Biennale last one ago, two years ago, with this piece. And um, we now developed an environment that moves. and um, I was interested in um, challenging the static nature of architecture, like in just what's happening now. I can whoop, I can move around, and you can move a little bit, but the space is kind of fixed. Yeah, and um, that the space moves, and the dancers could be still, or the dancers can move, and the space moves. And then I was fascinated with we could move the space because we gave him a tool. We didn't program it; he programs it, and he can make it. He can make it operate, and it can become flat. It can become open. It can be. It can move. It, it can be very um, vibrant and kind of um, energetic kind of nervous or it can move very slowly and calmly. 
and then he programs it and the space initiates movement of the dancer or the dancer can initiate the space and so this reciprocity between the human character and architecture and so you get these really different situations where it can become a new ground we also added um, a piece there's a thin and a fat one we put a anthropomorphic piece in it so there's also an architecture that's literally connected to the person that's two meters high that they also used and the dancer again kind of engaged in these pieces and here's, here's the other one the thin one and again we just produced the pieces and said it's your tool you do what you want although I showed up now and then and we collaborated and talked about various ideas of how these things would be used the lights you can't see these guys have lights in them both of them do and then again you see the kind of huge kind of variation you get out of that and then of course you start projecting and it kind of starts going again and uh, it became really interesting Huh. You get it, right? Okay. <laughs> Moving closer to architecture. Um, kind of a very unique project, which would um, have some strange tangency to this project. We um, were asked to do the, uh, we went a competition to do the um, headquarters for NOAA. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency and outside of DC and um, in Suitland, Maryland. And um, the site is uh, down here. You're looking at a ComSat photograph from 100 miles in the air. And uh, there's, there's the satellite. It's kind of an old one. And um, this became interesting to us, but this is how they see the site. They have um, a couple hundred people that look at computers and they actually don't see pictures. They, it was kind of disappointing. I thought they saw beautiful pictures. They look at X's and O's, but they see the site through their own mechanisms and they're looking down and um, it became really fascinating because we very early on decided really um, what we wanted we the client and us um, by the way they saw they see themselves as the caretakers of the world in the biggest terms they, they observe the world and they can talk about um, ocean flows Nino hurricanes right and when you look at photographs and they're kind of the the little brother or sister of NASA because they've got kind of, a, I shouldn't say this, but they have kind of an inferiority complex because nobody kind of, the NASA, the big, big cowboys, they're right, they're, they do the big stuff and they go out basically. These guys go in and do what a lot of people think is kind of boring. But if you start looking at the paper, if you look at anything from this, you'll see Noah and little teeny letters. And so we looked at this and said, okay, really what we want is the primitive hut. We want nature kind of left alone with high tech because this is what it is. They have ears to the satellites and they have their site. And we came up with this idea of um, leaving the site empty it was about eight acres, leaving it empty, and there's one piece that goes across it on the Mercator with the dishes. And in this are all the computers and in their mission control. And um, three and a half acres of space. There's a landscape piece that does this. And there's the space, all horizontal, huge, vast space, the parking below, which was actually um, historically talking about the Indian mound, the stupa that was there originally, or was part of the indigenous environment five, six hundred years ago. And that was the environment, it was cut with plazas where sun would come in. And then there's this one piece floating and it gave them the uninterrupted um, view of the satellite dishes. And um, here it is. And then we kind of lifted that ground plate up on one edge to allow light to come through. And then again, um, gave them an icon. And this was just about tongue in cheek. Because we were saying, okay, you're the guys that need the uh, kind of a big, meaty building with a big thing on us. We built this huge, these are like two stories high, Noah, and gave them an icon, which is literally just lo completely logical. That's what they, it's ears in the sky, um, uploading and downloading their 22 satellites. And uh, it's just about non design other than an idea, because this is probably the least designed project that we've done in our lives. There's really, it, it's about an idea and there's no kind of stylizing. That makes sense? It's not kind of worked with in terms of style. And then we haven't got very good photographs. Here it is from, again, that land and we kept the baseball diamonds and all the kind of things I had on it. And kind of here's that space and it's, um, the first thing they said is, oh my God, it's underground, we can't work underground. I go, no, 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 it's not, it's hybrid. It's actually more open than a normal office. They had typical deep, deep level, like 100, 100 foot floor plates where it's dark and maze-like. And we said, oh no, this is a more, this is Johnson Wax at um, Wright. Huge air, 
huge light, much, much more light. In fact, um, again, we cut down electricity. Uh, we worked with very, very kind of tough standards of getting the energy down. And we have a, a, a sod roof, of course. Ended up being really quite lovely. And this is the mission control. And this immense thing. This is right out of um, Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> um, shifting again to or maintaining performance and um, which you could also uh, kind of focus on sustainability. Our building in San Francisco has been kind of extremely <coughs> fascinating. Um, San Francisco skyline, kind of our work in the middle of it, we're on Mission and 7th. If you know San Francisco, it's right next to the 9th Circuit Court of Appeals, the infamous 9th that gets overturned every three seconds, and um, <laughs> right at the edge of, of, of the, the City Hall. And um, uh, San Francisco is a fascinating town. It's, you know there's a huge divide between San Francisco and LA. We supposedly hate each other, which I can't quite figure out. I love San Francisco. Oh, I could never live there, I have to say. It's so stodgy. That may be similar, I've been hearing words that there's stuff between here and Fort Worth, but maybe that's not true. But um, we got there and they weren't particularly excited that LA architects showed up. And uh, we looked at it, but then when I, if you really look at San Francisco, it doesn't have any buildings. It's, a, it's actually kind of a case for really great urban planning if you look for the buildings, they're, they're, it's just about ghetto. It's amazing, right? If you really look at Union Square and actually look at every building around the square, you'll be shocked. It's absolutely horrible. But the, 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 the topography and the, the diversity of buildings and the, the community allude to something. It's, 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 it's the proof of synthesis. It's, it's one plus one equals eight, right? But we showed up, and um, they also don't have a lot of modern buildings, and we were interested in um, contributing and it had a top. We knew you, it's a contribute, it's a building that's about skylines and we knew that was going to happen and I'll talk about it in a minute kind of where that came from. And um, it had a presence and it was quite different in terms of its presence based on performance because this would be about energy because I'm going to talk about the skin in a minute and kind of where it came from. And um, we're developing an idea which allows um, an urban space that faces the court. It's going to be kind of right here in the courthouses right there. And uh, we left um, a third of the site empty, and it'll be the major public space of the Mission District, and there'll be a, um, uh, a seed. It'll be a, a development core for the future city, and it's already being seen as that. We kind of left a little fragment of something, which is the cafe, and um, then the building kind of flat, tilted up, um, 50 feet wide, very, very narrow, using European standards. And here we are, that, that, that fold comes through. Again, you'll see it in a minute. There's a big courtyard, the cafe's over here, and here's the the historic building, and we purposely cleared the site off to open up the historic building in the most traditional terms. They actually wanted to fill the site with a five-story building. We're going, no, 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 no. Because again, I don't see the world in terms of radical, traditional. They're all options. And I'm going, no, you, you, want, you want an urban space in front of a historic building like they did in the Renaissance. It doesn't change. That's all you need. You don't need to reinvent it. You want something very simple. And we went about and did that. And well, then we started dealing with the skin. And it's something we've been working on for about five years. We did it in the Hoopa Bank, and we did it in, in Korea um, a couple years before this. And um, several things took place. We were going to develop a skin, well, it actually kind of does this. And then it was going to kind of grab onto the land and kind of make another idea. The building doesn't sit on the land anymore separate. It's connected. It's seen as one thing. And then we're going to fill this. We're going to fill this with social activities. And um, it's going to be performative. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, Mm, I kind of have it backwards. Um, there it is, just the skin. And um, it's going to take 50% of the heat off the building, and it's going to move and control air between this skin and the glass skin. Right? And it's going to have huge, huge performance effects. Um, it replaces the air conditioning. We took the air conditioning out of 75% of the upper part of the building, and um, it's just the skin. There's no, you can't go to dial a backup system. There is no backup system. And it works. Well, I hope it works. Oh, I'm sure I hear about it. It doesn't, but it's working. And, um, and you, you behave differently. There's uh, 13 days out of the year we can't meet performance. And they agreed um, that that would be adequate because of this. Because the delta, this number keeps changing. And I said 500. It might be 450, et cetera. But it, the delta is huge. It's, it's over half a million dollars. And with maintenance and with other kind of aspects, it looks like it's going to about three quarters of a million dollars a year, and it power a couple hundred to 500 to 600 homes. So it's huge. And so again, we're building for the government of the United States, for the federal government, 
and we're saying this is a prototype. If you keep building like this, um, it has huge, huge implications, right? And then, of course, it works on the simple parameter. We worked with uh, OVRP Engineering and with um, Berkeley Livermore Labs for uh, two years to open windows. It sounds crazy, right? All we did is open windows. It's actually computer driven. It's driven by um, information, uh, data, weather data that comes from NOAA, which is kind of <laughs> whoop back, right back to us. So, um, and, and, and it's, it's your guiding light from a, an upper level and a lower level, and they're continually moving to control temperature. And um, I don't think I have a side, and the, the ceiling is a cosine curve, concrete, it cools the, the thermal mass, et cetera, and it uses all those kind of principles. And, um, and then the north side um, is a set of glass fins, and those glass fins um, deal with incident light at the edges in the summer, early morning, late afternoon, and they guide the air through. Because we have a consistent air that's moving at about 15 degrees, and they help guide the air, and they also make this beautiful, beautiful skin, this big, thick, three-dimensional skin, but it's performance-based. So again, for me, this has been a fascinating building, because when people talk about they like or don't like it, and they get to um, that one, um, couldn't be stone, couldn't be brick, couldn't be stucco, um, couldn't be solid metal, you have to see through it, you can see through it like a screen, and, and more and more, the look of the building is completely connected to how it performs. And so, you, and, and I find as people understand it more, they like it better. And it'd be like looking at a helicopter. Take some object that's kind of an odd object, as you know more about it, it becomes logical and it becomes more likable, I, I think. That's my theory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's probably the right theory to have as an architect, right? Um, and then we had, we loaded it with kind of ideas. We took what is a generic building and tried to make it very ungeneric. And an office building is seen as kind of not, not a project, it's a, it's a skin for an architect. And we put skip stop um, elevator, it stops every three floors, um, and you walk up, walk down, meaning you're only stopping one third the floor, you get exercise. Um, when we were doing this, I don't remember which surgeon in general we had, but it was a bush appointee, just came out with a report that uh, stair climbing was the most efficient way to exercise, and we thought that was really hilarious, so we, we actually used this calculation and, and said if a person climbs a step X amount of times to lunch, entering, leaving, that he would live uh, four hours, five minutes, and 13 seconds longer. <laughs> and uh, our client uh, got a great laugh out of that. And then, and then this folded area, we have a daycare center, not a museum, not a kind of honorary place, a real use space, because today uh, over 50% of women work, and uh, this is a place that has those places that their kids are right in their place, and you come right by them when you go to the lobby. And then again, they're going to behind this little piece of grass lawn. You're going to go by, and the daycare center is right behind that. And then you're going to look at the skip stops. Here they are. You kind of walk up to the sky, walk out of the building, and go up again. And then, again, the public space. You're going to see in a minute a huge kind of honorific public space. Again, the daycare center here. And then a park in the air, a public park, an open space. And um, here it is at night. And um, well, we had great opportunity. We worked with Ed Ruscha on the skip stop libraries, and he did these lovely um, um, palindromes, backwards and forwards, and they're totally, Ed's this nutty guy, he's like, do geese believe in God? Stuff like that, uh, <laughs> it, it works both ways, and he did it vertically, and it's really clever, so as you go up and down the elevator, when you look out the door, it doesn't matter which way you're going, they say the same thing. He's, he's an amazing guy, and then we worked with um, James Terrell, and he did this piece right here, and he did one of his light pieces, building is just finished. It's, we're opening it in two weeks, and it's even not quite operational yet, but here's the piece he did. And um, you can see this from three kilometers away. If you're going to a, a giant game, you can see it from whatever that stadium's called. And um, you can see it as you enter the city from the south in the airport, and it's really amazing. And, and um, kind of the right place for public art, and uh, that it really is public, and it seemed to be really appropriate for uh, San Francisco. And then you're looking out of this space, here we are up on one of the bridges, the bridges are here because you're going right across to your office, right across to the office, right? Because you're literally, when you get off the elevator, you come through the public space to go to work, a second public space in the air, and you get these incredible views. I don't have the shop. But this way you're seeing uh, the bay, and the other way you're seeing the city. And it's just really, really, and again, we're using the vibrancy of San Francisco as the fabric. And then as the skin peels away, that's the entry. We're going to enter in that place. You're coming from subway, so that um, more or less 100% of the people here are on subway. And then this is that space. And then it was purposely made just about cathedral-like, Gothic-like, not traditionally modern, and wanted something immensely kind of honorific. And it was um, 
we kind of recognized that we were kind of ridiculously optimistic and a kind of a funny time in history about um, the US of A or working for the government. And it refers really just about the, to um, the WPA or a period of time when, when architects were making really serious buildings and um, that were seen as producing a status for this culture in this country. And then um, we littered a certain way and as the, the day changes, it transforms into something very different. And you can see it's opening up for the roof. There's more light coming through here. You're looking, which you can't see here because of film. Maybe the last one. That's just, well, that's just the nice Circuit Court of Appeals. And it makes, again, direct reference to the history. And then at night, again, it's transforming again. And it's, um, it, it keeps turning into somewhat a different type of space. And then looking from the entry back, you're looking at a stair, and the stair is part of a social order. And again, it'd take me some time, but the whole thing is thought about as a um, connectivity of social functions. And here's that stair that goes up into a kind of middle floor. And again, part of it is stair, and part of it is bench. OK, kind of parallel to this building, um, we were working on, actually, the, the San Francisco got started earlier, and this got started just later, but this one moves quickly. This was uh, probably the most unusual project we've ever done. We, um, we designed and built this in um, 30 months. So we had been designing for three months and they were digging a hole, a big hole. It's a million point two square feet. And uh, I remember at the time thinking it was gonna tank me. It was just gonna end my career. I was really, really upset. And we built it for nothing, just literally nothing. And, uh, and it ended up being a, a fascinating project which absolutely changed the culture of my office and that it got us very much involved in construction in a way we've always been very hands-on. We have a firm that's very much like a European or Japanese firm. We work all the way through construction. Was, architects don't produce drawings, they produce buildings. And if you produce buildings, you've gotta be on the job site to organize that project. Otherwise, you will not recognize it, guaranteed. And um, this was for Caltrans, who build freeways. And so it was kind of a perfect job, in a way, because we're very interested in infrastructure as an idea, and we build things that are not finished, and all of our work has been kind of looked at as it keeps kind of moving places like we haven't finished it yet, and it alludes to the continued kind of accretion of the way cities build. And so here we are building for the people that make freeways and build freeways. And it started with the infrastructure and signing and all of the things that they do. And um, with this huge, the site was on 1st and Main, which is the beginning of, the, of Los Angeles. And it's 100 Main and 100 First. And um, first, we had the letters um, Varun or Zoom. <laughs> and that was a little, too, a little too much comic stuff going on there for them. And we couldn't get that one. Then we just said, oh, let's do 100. And we made it four stories high, and it's part of the Hollywood sign, it's part of Los Angeles, it's part of the culture of the city. And um, it's seen with the, the infrastructure, et cetera, of the car. And it's this very simple building. Again, we use the same skin, performs a little differently. It's in California, it takes a lot of the heat. We can't possibly take the air conditioning out, but it reduces the load for it. it has some of the same ideas. It moves, which I can't show you, the, the backside and part of the context. It has this long light. You can see Disney Hall is, there's Dorothy Chandler. Disney Hall is way up there. It was very much about that. Um, let me see, Lee. No, I wanted to show you something else. The, um, the, court, the uh, a courtyard, kind of a square, which is not part of the Los Angeles. We were saying, no, there has to be a pedestrian um, kind of future of LA. And we put a quarter of the site with a plaza. Um, and as you move to the plaza, you move into another exterior space, which I'm gonna show you, which is in here. And then the facade is activated by the human character and people become part of the the nature of the building itself, that infrastructure. And then um, we had this really kind of lovely time working with Keyson A, um, light artist from, um, from Manhattan, and um, convinced the, uh, the client group, which was the state of California, et cetera, um, to put everything into one sculpture, because we thought Los Angeles, and the scale of Los Angeles, didn't want a series of kind of trinkets cluttering up the site, and we wanted one large structure, and it's, it's, a, it's a hundred meters long. It's the length of a soccer field. And um, it was Kisune's largest work. And um, it's neon, and what you don't see is it's changing randomly on a continuous pattern. And what we're interested in is extending the life of the building into the evening, because LA um, just closes at 5.30, 6, 7 o'clock, it's just dead. And it will change. They're actually starting to build housing there now, and it will change. We wanted to be part of that kind of instigating kind of the real life of the city. And everything's made out of transparent stuff, glass, light, infrastructure that connects to what they do as freeway. And then sure enough, or, or 
lucky enough, or we actually succeeded in some way. Um, I don't know, what was it, Anne? It was six months or five months after they opened the building, they did start having activities. And the first one was a group of artists that were all light artists that went to work on it. And it, couldn't, it couldn't have been better for us. It was really, really lovely. It did exactly what we wanted. And then just quickly, a project that's under construction right now in New York, uh, Cooper Union, which is very much about an urban project. It's next to the foundation building. Cooper Union is, um, if you're an architect, it's one of the most famous schools in the 20th century. Um, and it was run by uh, John Haydick, who was a, um, I don't know, he's kind of Joseph Boys of architecture. He has this huge kind of moral, ethical position that's kind of unstoppable. And um, a school that I was very, very familiar with as a student. And we're building their new pro project, which is here, and has a huge open space, which is a vertical piazza, which opens up to the street and energizes the street. It's part of the energy of New York and using, again, the, uh, the energy and the creative and, and, and uh, um, um, intellectual capital of the students to participate um, that in the space which is right parallel to Astor Place. And then again, um, it's, it, it's an engineering, art, and architecture school. Again, it's, it's unique and it's connected as disciplines. And we didn't have room. We wanted to make a campus. We made a vertical piazza instead of a horizontal one. And you, again, you stop at only two stops. And in those stops, everybody, everybody gathers together. And that's where the Coke machines are and the, the pool tables and all the kind of social functions. And uh, it's been a fascinating project. OK, shift now from way from the beginning on the kind of the, um, the um, installations, the mechanical stuff. 10 minutes? Huh. All right. Um, What's, what's interesting in, in all projects, it's not always literal. In the projects you have, it's a very complicated site as it attaches to or doesn't attach to elements of the city. And um, I think you might find this interesting. We were um, given this project about six years ago. And um, uh, we were invited because the, the, the university, and, and Ron Call, the architect of the university, recognized that we were architects that were really interested in context, which was kind of unusual at the time because we were kind of lumped together with kind of object makers and icon makers. And we had this kind of fascinating site. There's a, two big quadrants. That's the University of Cincinnati. And there's another one that starts there. That's a medical campus. And they've been using, um, quote, um, famous or uh, design architects. And um, Peter Eisen got the first job and did this. And Michael Graves did this guy. And uh, B, 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 um, uh, uh, Freed, Paycop Freed did this one. And um, when they got to this project, they decided they're going to take a different course. And what they wanted was a building that acted as a connective tissue to the campus. And um, I think what I'm showing you, yes. This is when we arrived, well, a little before even, even Peter was there. This, it was a parking lot and a series of buildings, right, all kind of clogging this up. And there was absolutely no continuity. And it's interesting, I'm driving through Dallas today and walking the site a bit. Um, it's amazing how we keep making the same mistakes. Uh, I started in urban design. I was with Victor Gruen in LA and then found it a bit frustrating to move back into architecture. And, and it, it looks like LA. And LA doesn't work too well. And it's been, it's been kind of understood as, in a critique now for a couple decades. And it's, um, it, it's not coherent. It's not a really super complicated argument at one level. You don't have to kind of look. You can't make. You can't figure things out. There's not much synergy. You don't have an opportunity to connect one thing to the next. And all really interesting cities and working cities, mostly European cities, there's a synergy. The buildings add up to something greater, and they make them more workable, more usable. And um, basically, um, it's not just the institutions you have. It's their accessibility. And LA is a great example. I live in both New York and Manhattan and LA. They have more or less equal assets, I'd say. Little different types of assets, more theater in one and less in another, et cetera. The difference is accessibility. In New York, I have instant accessibility to, to a huge amount of stuff. In LA, it's accessibility. It's there, but I can't get to it, right? And then as the infrastructure gets bogged down, which it is now, and it seems like this city's either heading there or already getting close to there, now you're starting to get really limited. And it's not the assets, it's, it's the, the connectivity of the assets. And, and definitely, this project, even if um, you're not asking your architect to do that, there's an awareness of that to look at the connectivity and how this piece works with the rest of the city and what kind of amendments can be made that make it more usable. 
And in this project, it was a great project, so that, that was gonna be our, pro our site. And then, well, George Hardgate's got there, and they asked him to make the connection. And he started connecting it, so the parking lots are gone, you can see everything he's done here. And again, that's gonna become our site. And now there's Peter, Eisman's been there, and Graves, I think, is he there yet? Yep, Graves is there. And all of this stuff now is starting to make this connection from both campuses, and this was the point that didn't work. They couldn't get them. This is the old campus right here, the main, the original campus. And so there we are now. And it's interesting because the building takes us clues from all the found stuff. It's not about us. It's about interpreting something that's there. And it's about not about a piece of architecture. It's about making the connection. So now you get to move through. This is more Rubeldale. This is um, Charlie Guathamy. And, and this is the football stadium and I'll show you in a minute. This is the old square, the original building, and it's all about kind of servicing that. And then with that now is, is um, the ability to have strategies that deal with complicated problems. A cube wouldn't work, a simple geometry wouldn't work. So what you're gonna look at here is an incredibly complicated project that'd be no way I could explain to you. It's easy just to go there and it actually makes sense. But it's gonna be a series of different uses. Let me see if I can, no, I gotta go back here. Um, it's a gymnasium. Uh, oh, I can't draw on this one, shoot. Um, I'll have to show another drill slide. It's, it's a, um, the main um, recreational facility, it's the main eating facility, it's academic space, and it's, um, it's housing, and it's infrastructure at the lower level. And uh, what was interesting about this project is the fluidity and how much you as an architect could get involved in program. The housing we initiated, and they agreed, and the academic space came much later in the design, and we initiated. And um, the project was incredibly organic in terms of how we explored the problem, the kind of questions we asked in terms of its development. And what happened that we became so interested in is we started developing a new model. Housing isn't off the campus, academic isn't one space, public isn't another. Everything started getting integrated. So it's the first housing that's in the middle of the campus, the academic space activates the movement space, and so on. With that came kind of huge amount of um, transparency, and this is what we're gonna have. There's this one huge kind of bar building that makes reference to Michael Graves on symmetry. And you're gonna see kind of the beginning of the scrim building with the academic space behind that's gonna make the connective tissue. And then we took the kind of folded roof and if we come behind us, we took George Hardgrave's landscape and made the roof part of the landscape. And when it snows, um, not quite enough yet, it actually literally blows together as the surface becomes red as landscape as part of George's work. And, um, and now we're moving under kind of a threshold piece, a gateway, and we're gonna be moved up the street, and you're gonna move up towards Charlie's building back here, and it's gonna be, um, I think I've got another one, yeah. It's gonna be, in some ways, a historical street. You could be in Siena, a San Gimignano, purposely tight, um, cosmopolitan. We wanted the students to squeeze in. We wanted them to feel really kind of connected and urban, right? And uh, you're gonna move up, and you're moving towards the the, the student union that Charlie kind of added to it, and it's a perfect relationship, exactly, and again, in a classical way, it could be Uffizi, right? And in terms of moving, and we're, we're pinching these people, and you're gonna see, we're gonna go underneath the building, and it gets quite complicated, and kind of looking back on the snow, ditto. And then, the, the, if you remember, the curve comes right out of the football field. And when you're there, you really realize, we use the football field as the major space, and took that line and brought it around, and you read it as a single thing, and we're trying to take all the things around it and bring them into one system. Because that's what really urbanism does. You organize things. I'm gonna end with that in our FAR project. And then you don't end up with a building, you end up with an urban ensemble. A series of buildings that are all connected to each other, right? It's a village. And then you get these subspaces. So you go down the stairs, this is that space behind, we're gonna go to Charlie's building there. You come down and you're about to enter the food facility in there, the gym passed us, and you continually find these spaces like you would find in a, in a medieval city. And you're going under between buildings, and they open up and they're outside again. And we've left um, clues of snow, clues of the outside. We leave skylights open, and then these skylights continue inside and connect inside and outside. And then these enormous spaces, literally acres of space, where this, this is the case, the gymnasium, the running track that's above the basketball, which you'll see again, and you're looking out at the football field. There's 80,000 people out there. You can see them in bleachers. This track that's the running track, which is, uh, everything was big there on that, that was their thing. You could, you could race two cars around this thing. Um, and here it is again, and we tried to give it a, 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 a character. Um, I used to run on a track 
like this on the East Coast when it's snowing. And, and you, we made it so you'd go inside, inside, outside, open, and it had like a variety so you can pace yourself. It's just not the same thing. Um, and then um, the pool, which is pushed way on the ground, Olympic pool, and you're gonna, the line is the walking. Huh. One of the paths comes right across here. So everywhere you walk, you connect and look in and see something. Everything's exposed. And we had great time in the gym because we had discussions about how the, the gymnasium, how exercise has completely changed in the last two decades. Because when I was young, I worked out in a gym, it was in a basement, it was smelly, and it was a big, you know, it was just guys, right? And today, everybody spends $200,000 in clothes, and, and, and they, they rent banks, and they put themselves in front of the busiest street possible, and that's, it's changed a bit, and we really use that kind of idea where, where um, the students are completely connected, and we, um, learning and exercise and, and socialization all get equalized, which is actually another interesting thing, because today, as you know, uh, with our Cooper project, um, Starbucks is their main learning center. You can go to three Starbucks around Cooper Union, that's where they're all full of computers, and that's where people learn. And actually, we, we use that in our program, cutting down a huge amount of space. And then, I'm gonna have to wrap it up pretty quick, right? Um, I wanted to say that uh, I just added this after walking around Dallas. I've been working on um, a series of projects about LA, called LA Now, and I've done four books. And um, I think a lot of the, what the approach we have to LA is very, very compatible with, with, with Dallas, and that it, it's, a, it's a very, it's the modern 20th century city, like it or not, it is that. And um, because LA in some ways is the prototype of that. And again, whether you like it or don't like it, in some ways is irrelevant, it just is. And um, I started studying it, and, and I started understanding it. Not many of us even understand what LA is. Well, it's 134 different communities. If you look at the metro, metro, metropolitan area of uh, about 17 million people. And I got interested in, in the scale of the city. Um, it's the fifth largest state in the union. Here you are, Texas. There we are, Dallas. All right, here's LA. Fifth largest state, um, seventh largest economy, et cetera. And then we started looking at other kinds of relationships and it's, it's equal to two times the size of Austria, the size of Holland, and on and on, right? And uh, it was incredibly useful. And in that, um, we've been doing more and more urban design work. We won the competition for the US Olympics Village in New York, which is a, kind of the end of, of Queens right here. And we kind of did this to it. And it, it started dealing in, again, whole ideas of, of connective tissue and strategy which again would somehow connect to this work that you're looking at. Um, even for a single building, you look in the m macro, and you look at how larger things connect to the building and how the building connects to the larger environment. And again, in, um, and then it connects to some sort of an architecture. And then again in Madrid, a project that we're working on right now, um, this large kind of new development that starts with a park which connects up the river, which they just put in over two billion euros for a six and a half kilometer park and we're taking that investment of the park and pulling it right through and connecting it to this is the beginning of the gate of the old city. And then um, two projects, quickly. Uh, God, I wish I had more time. Such a, this, is, this is the most interesting personal project I ever had. A courthouse in Eugene, Oregon, working for Chief Justice. There's 50 of them, right? Uh, Chief Justice of Oregon. Um, won a competition. Uh, he wanted that. That's the Supreme Court. And got us and was horrified, <laughs> just <laughs> terrified. Actually tried to fire us, and he, he's a judge, he should know this, he couldn't do that. And, um, and then decided we, had to, we were gonna live together, and um, he took me here, as if I never saw uh, the Supreme Court, and, and I reminded him, it's a, a steel frame building, a very modern building by Cass Gilbert, and then he, he reminded me that it was built on budget, it was built in 1933 in the middle of the Depression. I said, Hogan, we probably are having a little different situation here. And then I took him to Paris, and showed him a series of buildings, and then, and then we became close friends. We share um, a love for Bordeaux. That's the most important thing. <laughs> and we, um, Pouliac. A good Pouliac is, it'll take care of everything. And, um, and we went to work finding a common ground, and again, it'd be a long story, but it's the relationship of um, how do you move forward in the modern architecture tradition? And um, how do you move forward um, a, a convention, which is actually necessary, certainly within this a third aspect of our government, the, the, the judicial branch, and um, it started with a, a whoop, it started with a, a courtyard, a courtroom. We spent a huge amount of time developing an idea of the courtroom, which you'll see in a minute, and and we it, it uses lo a lot of um, really traditional ideas. It's just an appeal to 
a Renaissance idea and has a broad stair, right? And uh, it has iconic pieces on the top, and I'll show you later. It shows them on the freeway. Again, a little bit similar to your site. And we started working. We work with all automated models. So he's looking at the same stuff we're looking at as we're working together. And, and I think most judges are kind of hands-on guys. They like, well, you stand up when they go in the room. They're used to that. And they like to make all the decisions. And it took me a while to figure out that I wasn't going to put down one little, I thought I could do that, and I could do that. And then he was interested. And, um, and we ended up with this, and it has a stair, and actually it's exactly the length of, of the um, Supreme Court, and it has the, a stair, which is <laughs> a, social, a social structure that's the piano nobly, which is a classical device, and it sits on a low kind of plinth. We put all the services, and then on top of that are the iconic pieces. And well, um, a little bit like your thing, it was seen from the freeway, and that had a little bit to do with the PLOT. So the actual pieces that are the iconic pieces are seen at the relative height of the freeway where people enter the city. And um, wasn't my site, a horrible site, ridiculous site. I wanted the middle of the city with a plaza. And the city just gave us a cheap ass site at the edge. And it and, and, um, wasn't our choice. But as architects, you, you, you interpret and kind of work, work at what it is, right? And, and here it is. And um, this is our work, for sure. This is not my work, meaning my studio. This is a completely 100% collateral project. There was nothing that was done that we didn't spend a jillion hours talking about over and over again. And, um, but it probably doesn't remind anybody of the Supreme Court by Cass Gilbert. <laughs> and um, a smoothness, a flow of people, a series of eddies, the movement of people from court to court. And the flows will be understood completely we get to the courtroom because the courtroom is made from these shapes. And uh, you, you, you will never understand until you fully use it. You just can't look at it and get it. You have to actually um, spend some time at it. And then, again, we figured if one piano nobly was good, two were better. So you walk in up one stair, and then you get in, and you walk up one more kind of formal stair into the main space. And then this is where all the threads come together, where all the complexity of the movement and the connectivity come together. And, um, and then as you're moving between things, you're kind of floating in the air, and you're, you're suspended in light. And we um, put a lot of time in the notion of um, space and movement, et cetera, and how you see people serendipitously, kind of with more casual kind of relationships as well as formal, because it's Eugene, and we wanted to break down the kind of huge formality and make sense for a smaller city, a very different kind of court than a, than a larger, more formal city. We're not building in Manhattan. And then again, we're working with, um, with um, Matthew Ritchie now. And uh, we developed these three pieces which guide you they're always at the edge of the court. You enter on both sides of the courtroom, so they're, they're markers, and they become kind of major light pieces. And, and he worked with them, and they're, um, they're a story of law, starting with the Magna Carta. They're quite fascinating. And then the courtroom, and we spent a huge, huge amount of time on this, of re-establishing the theater of the courtroom, of kind of repositioning the jury as they have some distance and are looking in at the proceedings. And then, um, kind of increase the position of the judge, big surprise, uh, <laughs> as it kind of pinches in, but then put kind of a gallows on top of it. And uh, um, there's a window over that kind of lights him. It's just about a religious space. The light kind of comes over his head. It's, um, but, and it does, I mean, people get the humor. It, it, we're, we're, you can't get too serious. It, it, it's human. And, and, and we're, we're, like I got really bashed by my liberal friends going, oh, you really caved into this guy, meaning I made him even more important than he is, and I should kind of, de I should uh, deconstruct him. And I go, no, 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 it's, it's, he's, he's whoever he wants to be. And um, the important thing is, I think the softer space, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a theater, and it's really um, the, the, um, the audience, the, uh, the observers, um, are in a very, very kind of different position. And then again, when you connect them, you get it. Okay, last project, just really quickly. Um, I'm showing this because of the, the shift of language. We're starting to move in a different direction. This is the far tower, which we won. And we wanted purely out of understanding the site. Of the 10 people, we were the only ones that really used the specifics of the site, which were just incredibly difficult, but incredibly interesting. That led us to a very different building. And to start with, the lobby is um, 110 feet in the air, which is a huge space that comes through, which is an urban space, it's stipulated by law, and it comes down on three points, and uh, it has a huge amount of square footage, a lobby which is about 23 stories high, a very early version, we're working on that right now, and then looking down at this space, this huge urbanistic space, you're coming up escalators, to be the longest escalators made, 
um, they're, they're moving you um, over 80 feet. And um, when you're moving to the end, you're looking at Paris, you're looking down, we're in La Defense, you're looking down at the city of Paris, and you're part of the transportation system still. You're all part of coming out of the, the mass transit station. And then, instead of a single shape of a building, it's really a series of shapes which have to do with a series of buildings. It's an urban project again. It's made out of a series of pieces. And then, it's Paris. I think the first time I really thought about literally making a building somewhat romantic. That Paris was just inescapable that we had to somehow kind of rethink the harder edged kind of stuff we've been doing. And um, um, oh, what's the film I'm thinking of? Um, the Australian. It, Vim Vendors made Wings of Desire, you know, and I was so taken by that. Anybody could make a film so outrageously romantic in this era, and it was uh, Moulin Rouge. I remember when I saw Moulin Rouge, I was just blown away. This, it's, it's, just, it's so over the top in, in, in its romance. It, it's like this person lives in another universe. And I was just taken by that. And, and I wanted some of that in this building. And uh, we spent some time. And I wanted to be, as you look at it from different places, it keeps becoming a different building. You don't see the same cube in the sky. It keeps reappearing. And now we're rationalizing it. We're just about done with schematic design, a great, great client. Um, it's the tallest building in Paris, the tallest building in Europe. And um, uh, I didn't talk about other stuff. It's got, it's got uh, solar and it's got uh, windmills. And now we're starting to deal with the skin in a more serious way. And today um, is amazing. The dates on here, those are the dates of how this thing works. We wrote a program, each panel, we can tell you when it optimizes. And there's, I don't know, 10,500 panels. And we're looking at the program now to get to exactly how it performs. It's again a performer skin, like in San Francisco, but something much more romantic, finally. And it's going to be really about, um, huh? Oh, this is my. There we go. We're writing a program, and the light is going to be embedded in the skin, and at night. Um, we're going to program the skin. And again, this is um, 10 centimeters shorter than the Eiffel Tower. They won't let us go above the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how it does this kind of thing, which is really, I thought it was kind of hokey to bidding. It's really quite beautiful. And we're now um, looking at the um, producing something much more dynamic. And we're working both with the skin itself, which will both be performance and an icon. And uh, again, um, finally, architecture is the marriage the connection between performance and um, functionality and um, filling one's aspirations and dreams through beauty. Thank you so much. <laughs>